Good evening, everyone, and a very warm welcome to the Bexley Mental Health and Wellbeing Awareness Webinar. I'm Dr. Emma Adjikum, a local GP. Tonight's event is hosted by NHS South East London Clinical Commissioning Group, Bexley Voluntary Service Council, BVSC, and Mind in Bexley. The COVID-19 pandemic has affected us all in so many ways. In addition to physical illness, it's contributed to mental ill health as we've all faced social isolation and loneliness, worries over our health and the health of loved ones, strains on relationships, concerns about job security, housing and finances, and much, much more. As professionals, we've noticed a significant rise in consultations about mental ill health and felt compelled to hold this event. We want you to know that we understand what you're experiencing and you are not alone. In addition to being able to seek help from your staff at your GP surgery, we hope that this webinar will empower you with information and resources to support your well-being. I'd like to encourage you all to use the question and answer box for any questions that you may have. We have a team with us tonight, including GPs, a pharmacist, mental health workers, and BVSC staff who will be answering your questions throughout the evening. We'll also be putting some of your questions to the presenters on the panel at the end of the evening. We'd also really value your thoughts on this event. You can use the Q&A box to give us feedback, what went well and what could be improved. We'll also be sending a follow-up email to all attendees to ask for feedback and provide you with a list of mental health support organisations and resources. Now, I'd like to stress that audience members are not visible, nor are they audible. So when posting questions, you can select to post them anonymously so that audience members will not be able to see your username. We are delighted to have with us Laura Burke of Mind Bexley and Alex Fordham of Community Connect. Laura will be speaking about the management of stress, anxiety and depression, and Alex will be explaining the role of Community Connect and the organisations that they signpost to uh, for help with problems such as mental ill health, bereavement, carer support, social isolation and debt management. Now, our first speaker may be a familiar face to some of you. Dr. Samina Shah is a GP and mental health lead at the Albion Surgery in Bexley Heath. She'll be discussing some of the physical and psychological symptoms of anxiety and depression, and I'll hand over to her now. Thank you, Dr. Shah. Good evening, everyone. Um, as some of you may know, I'm Dr. Shah. I'm a GP at the Albion Surgery in Bexley Heath. And we're just going to start this evening just with a very brief overview of some of the symptoms of depression, anxiety and panic attacks. Some of these things you may already know and be familiar with, but some of them may be a little bit less obvious. And there is an overlap between them as well. And we'll be looking at the physical impact that mental health has on your body. We're going to start with looking at depression. So these are some of the psychological symptoms of depression. So that's really how does depression make you feel? So it can make you feel low and down and tearful. It might make you irritable. So you may find yourself getting annoyed by things that wouldn't normally annoy you. It can affect your concentration and your memory. That in turn can lead to difficulty making decisions. That can affect your self-esteem and confidence. You may find then that you avoid people or social events because of that. And then that can obviously have a negative impact on work and on your relationships as well. You may find that you don't enjoy things, that things that you would normally have enjoyed, you don't, that you don't have motivation. You may feel numb and you may feel hopeless. And as well as all of these psychological symptoms, depression can also give you some physical symptoms as well. So it could make you quite tired and lethargic. It can disturb your sleep. And that's something that we've seen a lot of in the last year. I think a lot of us have found that it, since the pandemic, our sleep has been disrupted. It can affect your appetite. Either way, for some people, it can reduce your appetite. You may feel you don't feel like eating anything. For other people, it might increase their appetite. You might come for eat. 
um, it can slow things down. So it can slow your movement and your speech. And if it slows down your bowels, that can lead to constipation. So you'll see there just a range of things that it can do and ways in which it can physically affect your body. And if we move on to look at anxiety, and if we look first at the psychological symptoms of anxiety, well, really the main thing here is worry. So that anxiety and that worrying all the time and worrying about things that you usually wouldn't worry about. And you can then end up feeling quite stressed and anxious or tense a lot of the time. That can then affect your concentration. And again, that can have a negative impact on your work and on your relationships. Now, anxiety can cause quite a lot of physical symptoms. And it's important to note that although these are caused by anxiety, they are very real physical symptoms. Anxiety causes your body to release adrenaline and various other chemical chemicals and hormones that have a physical effect on your body. And these are just some of the things that they that can cause. So palpitations, so you might feel your heart racing or pounding, you might feel sweaty, you might get tummy aches or a churning stomach and diarrhea. You may get headaches, in particular what we call tension headaches, which is where you carry a lot of tension in the muscles in your neck that can lead to headaches. And again, it can disturb your sleep and it can cause other things in sleep as well. So you might clench your jaw or grind your teeth. That's another sign of anxiety. Now, some people with anxiety may get panic attacks. Uh, these can come on quite suddenly and they can be quite scary. So panic attacks are characterized by palpitations again. So feeling the heart racing or pounding. You may feel sweaty or sick with it. Um, you may get chest pains or difficulty breathing. And then you may feel that you're going to faint or worse. They can be very scary. And then there can be a snowball effect. You have a panic attack is very unpleasant and very scary. That then makes you worry that you may have it again. And then you can see there's a vicious circle and how you could then get more panic attacks. So any treatment for panic attacks, the aim is to try and break, break that cycle. Now, we'll be looking today at the support that's available to you. Um, we won't be talking specifically about medication, but if you do have any questions about that, please do ask in the chat and we'll be happy to answer any questions about that. But I'm now going to hand back to Dr. Adjikam and we'll start to look at all the support that's available to you. Thank you so much for that overview, Dr. Shah. Our next speaker is Laura Burke from Mind and Bexley. She is a training communications lead. Many thanks. Hello everyone. Right, let me get my presentation ready for you all. Okay, would someone be able to just let me know you can see that? Fingers yes, that's perfect. perfect. Excellent, thank you very much. Well, welcome everyone and thank you very much for coming on today and spending some time of your evening coming on to look at how we can improve our well-being, our mental health and also the services available for you. Um, I think it's really good that we've just covered kind of symptoms of anxiety and depression because a lot of people who are really stressed don't often know how they feel when, when they're overwhelmed. And it gets to the point where they feel completely overwhelmed and it gets too much. And actually there's things that we can put in place before that. Um, so maybe something for you to do is kind of write a few notes down as we go along throughout this course and just have a think about what it is for you. How do you know you're stressed and what it is for you um, how is your body telling you that you're overwhelmed? Um, and my aim today is to kind of look at different coping strategies that we can use and ways that we can look after our well-being. So without further ado. So firstly, with mental health, we speak a lot about talking to people around you. And I know it's everywhere, isn't it, about um, ask people twice how they're feeling and talk to those around you, call Samaritans, call helplines. Um, and for a lot of people, that's great but not everyone will have somebody that they feel that they can open up to. However, why do we say to talk to people? The reason we say to talk to people around you is because number one, it takes it away from just you, that pressure from what you're feeling becomes something else, it's something shared, which can be really helpful. 
Um, another one, why it's really helpful to talk to people around you about how you're feeling is because sometimes people can give us a different perspective. So I'll give you an example. If I was quite anxious about holding this talk today um, and I kept it in and I kept it in and I didn't speak to anyone about it, I might feel really overwhelmed. The anxiety might have overwhelmed me and I might find it really hard to do this talk today. Whereas if I spoke to somebody about it, maybe I'd get a different perspective. Maybe someone would say to me, you know what, Laura, don't worry. You've done presentations before. I'm sure it'll go OK. Someone else might say to me, do you know what, Laura, don't worry about it. If you make a mistake in the presentation, only you're going to know about that because no one knows what you're going to talk about. I like that one. Um, so that's why we always say to talk to people around you. And we understand that at times we don't feel we can communicate to people around us for many different reasons. And if that is you, if you are listening to this right now and you think that you've wanted to speak to somebody for a long time, there are lots of services in the borough that can support you and we are here to help. We want to help and we want to listen. So please do utilize them services. So now we're gonna move on to mindfulness. So mindfulness is kind of a bit of a buzzword in mental health really. And when we look at wellbeing, if you look at self-help, you'll notice that mindfulness comes up quite a bit. And the reason that is, is because mindfulness is really good at putting you in the present moment. So you're not thinking about the past, you're not thinking about the future, you're in the here and now. So right now, what's going on for you right now, you're listening to the sound of my voice, um, you're probably looking around your room, you might be focusing on the, the phone, you might be focusing on your tablet, but you are in this moment. And there is lots of research to suggest that when we do practice mindfulness effectively, it can really help us manage depression. And the reason that is, it can help us become more aware, it can help us become more self-aware of our emotions and how we're feeling. It can help us feel calmer and less stressed. It can help us feel more able to choose how to respond to our thoughts and feelings. So often when we're feeling quite overwhelmed, we react quite quickly without thinking beforehand. And what mindfulness does, tries to get you into a calm state where you are in control of what happens next. You can start to think about do I want to react to this? How do I want to be in this situation? Do I want to comment back in this manner? Um, it will also help you cope with difficult thoughts or feelings and it will also help you be kinder to yourself. So there are lots of ways that you can do mindfulness um, and it is really dependent on you. So I would have a really good look online. There's lots of free resources. YouTube's a great one. Um, and just type in kind of mindfulness exercises, meditation, um, you know, and what I would say if you were a beginner to mindfulness, um, I wouldn't jump in and do like an hour meditation because that might be a bit much. Um, even five minutes, five minutes to get yourself in to being in a calm state where you're just focusing on the music or somebody's voice and you're focusing on your breathing. It can be really, really powerful. Um, I do this talk quite often um, around the community. And what I have said before is what I really like about mindfulness is that it's free. And you don't really need to announce to anyone that you're doing it. So if I was focusing on my breathing, for instance, I wouldn't need to announce to everyone, go, right, everyone, it's time to do a breathing exercise. It's something that I can do at work. I can do it on the bus. I can do it on the train. I can do it wherever I need to do. And um, there are lots of apps that you can use as well, such as Headspace, the Calm app, which is a really, really good app. Um, there's also Headspace on Netflix. If people have Netflix, they've got some meditation episodes that go through slightly different emotions, which can be really useful. Um, and as I said, YouTube clips can be really helpful as well. So if you practice mindfulness at the moment or meditation and you found something that works for you, please put it in the chat because somebody else might really benefit from it and that would be really helpful. So that's mindfulness. Next, another one is about looking after your physical health. You know, we know that there's a strong relationship between our mental health and our physical health. And there's no surprise that when we're feeling quite stressed, you know, our body kind of um, shows us that in different ways. Um, you know, some people, like um, was rightly said, some people might find that they're not sleeping well or, um, you know, they're having breakouts in their skin or they're just tired all the time. And there is a real relationship between that. And because we know that, that means that we can do something to make it better for us. So experiencing anxiety or depression can make it hard to find energy to look after ourselves. Um, but by taking small steps to look after your physical health, it can really make a difference to how you feel. 
Um, so I think this is a very easy one to say, but probably quite hard to do. Um, try and get yourself uh, into a good sleep routine. Lots of adults, especially when they're feeling quite anxious, feeling quite depressed, there's a lot going on in their life, their sleep really suffers. Um, and what I would say is do a bit of education into sleep, you know, look into how um, you can get into a sleep routine. There's lots of sleep apps out there, try to get bed, go to bed at the same time each night, um, make sure you do something relaxing before bed, um, write down your thoughts before before you go to bed and then write your thoughts and write your solutions um but i will go into later there is more things um more resources out there for sleep next one think about your diet you know we know for instance if you're having kind of a high intake of sugar and high intake of caffeine you know this is going to have a detrimental effect on you you know i guess what i always say is what goes up must come down and if you are somebody that's having loads of sugar you're going to have a temporary high but then what you're going to feel is, is you're going to crash and you're going to feel quite a considerable low. And it's the same as caffeine. Um, I would say with caffeine as well, if you're somebody that is quite anxious um, and gets maybe heart palpitations or, or gets shakes, um, caffeine can exacerbate them feelings. So do be mindful of the intake that you're having. Another example um, is break up your physical activity that you are doing. For people who are depressed um, or even anxious, the last thing they want to do is go and exercise. You know, you're feeling unmotivated. You're not, you maybe you're not wanting to get out of bed. You don't want to go to work. You don't want to see people. And then you've got me from mine going, go and exercise. Um, you don't want to do it, um, which I completely understand because it just feels too much. So what I would say to you, if this is you and you know you need to exercise or you know you want to exercise because you know it makes you feel good and everyone keeps going on about it, then break this down. So don't say to yourself, I'm going to go for an hour walk or half an hour. Say to yourself, I'm going to get dressed and I'm going to walk to the end of the road. That's all I want you to do. I want you to walk to the end of the road. If when you walk down the end of the road, you feel you can go a little bit more, then take that distance. That'd be great. If you can't, come back again and, and say, well done, because you got to the end of the road, you got up and you did it. And then just spread that to, to a bit further. And what you're doing, you're giving yourself small achievable goals that will lead to bigger goals. That is what we're, we're trying to achieve here. Um, next, take care of your personal hygiene. Um, you know, we know that when we look after ourselves, that makes us feel good in turn. And try to avoid drugs and alcohol. Like I said before, what goes up comes down. And, you know, we find with drugs and alcohol, you know, they can give us a temporary high. Well, drugs especially. Um, but we know alcohol is an antidepressant. Antidepressant is a depressant. Um, and lots of people, when they drink alcohol, they feel great for a little bit, but then they feel quite low. Um, if you're already and you're feeling low anyway, that might not be the best thing for you. So the aim of the presentation today is to try to find different coping strategies that can be helpful for you. So another way that we can look after our wellbeing is to try and keep active. Um, and there are loads of ways that we can do that. Have you ever thought about volunteering, for instance? You know, have you got some time on your hands where you can give back, but also it's something for you to um, have a sense of achievement? Um, is there a, a new thing you'd like to try? Or is, or is there a hobby you used to have that you stopped? You know, maybe it's about looking back at that and seeing if you can implement that into your life again. Um, I would say as adults, you know, as we grow, um, and, you know, life pressures hit us and we might have a family or in a caring role. You know, it, it tends to be that we come last, but actually we need to come first as well. And we need to do things that help our well-being. Um, you can always join a group as well, you know, a social group, something that um, you meet others, but you're doing something that you enjoy going to. You know, I would always say, don't stop the things that you enjoy. You know, we can't always do them you know, 24 hours in a day, because that wouldn't be life, unfortunately. But maybe we can implement one or two bit joyful things within that week, to break up your week and to give you something to look forward to. It might even be calling a friend. It might be watching a particular show. It might be, as I said, joining a new group. Whatever it is for you, make sure you're implementing that into your routine. Next, learn to accept yourself. I think this is really, really important when it comes to mental health. We are all very hard on ourselves. You know, we, we think we've got to be the best or we've got to do this right. And, you know, we've gone through something that we would never have expected to go through before. And we're gonna be talking about this for years and years and years. 
And for lots of us, you might, we might think, right, okay, brilliant, we're all going back to work, that's great, or we're all going back to some sort of normality. Um, but that's hard for a lot of people. You know, we've been in a bit of a bubble. So do give yourself that time and do allow yourself to feel them feelings. Um, and when it comes to accepting yourself, you know, realize the good in you. And we're going to go through that now. So one of the most important steps in maintaining mental well-being is to learn to accept yourself. If you value yourself, you are more likely to have positive relationships with other people and find it easier to cope with difficult times in your life. So do we agree with that? Do we agree that if we feel better in ourselves, then we seem to have better communication, better relationships, and life seems to be better? If that's the case, if, if some of you are nodding, if you're saying yes, then that's great because that means that we've got a lot of control and there's a lot of things that we can do to improve the way we feel and improve our life. So here are some ways that we can help increase our self-esteem. So number one, try not to compare yourself to other people. Um, I know it's hard to say, but you know, we, we do it often. And when we do compare ourselves to others, all that happens is, is we come across in a negative way. We always think, you know, why can't I be like this person? Why can't I have their money? You know, why can't I look like them? And actually what you've got to remember when you're comparing is we are all very, very different. That's what makes us so special. We're all unique. And when we are comparing ourselves to someone and maybe we're saying, oh, you know, they've got a great house, etc. We only see a snapshot of what's going on in someone's life. We don't know about anyone's life. We only know about our own. So when we are comparing, we're already at a bias there because we don't have a full picture. So if this is you and you're comparing yourself, maybe social media is a, is a key one. Come off social media for a bit. You know, there was a time that we didn't have social media and we was OK. We got by. So if this is you, come off it for a bit, have a bit of a break and then go on when you need to. Next one, acknowledge your positive qualities and the things you're good at. I think often a lot of us say what we can't do, what we're not good at, rather than what we do do. And a lot of people sometimes think that that's a bit arrogant or they, you know, they're, they're being quite... Um, I can't think of the word for being quite arrogant and actually it's not you know we're all great at doing something and it's really good that you know that in yourself and um, so what I would like you to do as well maybe you can do it now while you, you're listening to me is write down a few of your positive qualities um you know whatever that is it might be I'm a good listener I'm a good friend I'm good at baking I'm good at I don't know doing it uh, I don't know changing a tire that was really random but who knows um and write it down either on your notes on your phone or on a piece of paper and keep that piece of paper with you all your notes and then whenever you're having a bit of a down day you can look at this and you can realize that yes this is a that this is a down day I'm not feeling myself but you know what I'm really good at this I'm a good parent I'm good this I'm a good that and that will help next one learn to identify and challenge your unhelpful thinking patterns I really believe if you can do this, you are winning at life because this one is something that would have great power for you and your well-being. So we have thoughts, as you all know, we have lots of thoughts. We have something like 80,000 thoughts in a day. Lots of our thoughts are random. Some of them are curious. Some of them don't make sense. Sometimes we make a whole dream in our head of what's going to happen that doesn't happen. And a lot of the time as well, we have thoughts that are quite negative. And these negative thoughts they become feelings and then feelings become behavior so for instance i'll give you an example if i um started this presentation today and in my head i'm saying i'm not good enough i can't do this i'm going to make my mistakes um you know no one's going to want to listen to me what do you think is going to happen do you think i'm going to be good at doing this presentation do you think i'm going to feel confident or do you think that actually that, that might start to have an effect on how I feel about myself? And consequently, I might mess up in the presentation or I might feel quite anxious. So learn to identify and challenge your unhelpful thinking patterns can really, really help. So what I mean by this is as soon as you've got a negative, as soon as you get a negative thought, I want you to challenge it. So for example, a lot of people will say they do something wrong, they make a mistake, they might say something like, I'm an idiot. For example, I'm an idiot. Okay. Let's think about that right now. I'm an idiot. If I think about that, that doesn't make me feel really nice about myself when I'm calling myself an idiot. So if I do that straight away, 
I can say things like I'm not an idiot because I work I'm not an idiot because I'm capable I can you know whatever it is to make me feel better so that's what I want you to do the next time you get a negative thought I want you to challenge it and think of a different perspective alternatively if you can't think of a different way to think I want you to think what somebody around you would say someone that loves you or someone that cares about you what would they say what advice would they give you um, and as you go through it might be quite hard to do at first but as you go through it can be a really helpful exercise that will help you moving forward and um, use self-help books and websites to help change your belief you know it doesn't happen overnight you know managing your negative thoughts and changing them into positives it takes time you know I, th I think the brain is a muscle and we need to work on it um, and the way to do that there's something called the good news network that I'd recommend where all good news I mean I like that um, I used to look at quotes positive quotes whatever it was but try to immerse myself into positivity and um, spend time with supportive people you know if you're not feeling yourself if you're feeling quite negative you need to be around people that pick you up and not bring you down um, and that leads us in nicely to being assertive and not allowing people to treat you with a lack of respect because we know that when that happens nobody's going to feel great are they and once again it's about engaging in hobbies that you enjoy as well so there's a few things there um, that we can do. Next, take time to relax. You know, a lot of people feel that it's selfish to relax, especially people who are caregivers, who look after families. They think that it's selfish to say, I need some time out, I need me time. It's not selfish at all, it's actually essential. It's essential to look after you. It all starts with you. Um, I like to use the analogy about when we go onto an aeroplane and they always say to us, don't they, when you're sitting with someone, whether it's a child, when you're sitting with a child, they will say, always put on your oxygen mask first before you put on a child. Why do they ask, why do they say that? Because if you don't put on your oxygen mask and when you're trying to put on a child, you pass out, you're no longer helpful or useful. So that's probably quite a strong analogy. But what I'm trying to say is, you know, the the kind of the care that you give to others it needs to begin with you too and it doesn't have to be you know something every single day if that's you can't fit it in or it feels a bit much but you know try and implement look at your week where is there time what can I do you know do I run a bath do I go for a walk do I call a friend do I learn yoga what can I do for me to help me and to help me relax so that's some things there. Um, and do put in the chat as well, you know, ways that you relax, you know, and it, we all learn from each other. Um, it can be really, really useful. Thank you. So I also wanted to add in the self-help slide. Um, however, we will be sending out the self-help information um, later on today. Um, so I've got some information about sleep, um, different ways of sleeping. I've added in some audible um, tapes that you can use. Um, I've looked into kind of depression and looked at like challenging our, our thoughts and different resources we can use. And then I've also looked into anxiety as well. Um, I've put in a list of self-help books that you can look at and you can download from the library, um, a list of apps to improve well-being, um, and also lots of different mind, mindfulness resources. So basically I'm giving you a lot of homework here. <laughs> I'm only joking. You do what you want to do. So now we've covered a lot in the management of how to look after ourselves. And I hope that's helped. I hope there's been something there that you can take away from that and, and, and start to implement. And I would honestly say, don't overwhelm yourself. Start off small and build up, you know, and it might be that you are currently exercising at the moment and you are um, looking after your physical health, but maybe there's an aspect in your life that you could um, add to, you know, maybe you do need a hobby or you need something fun to work work on whatever that might be so now what I want to do is I want to just move on now to our um, services so at Mind in Bexley we are a charity for a mental health charity for anybody in Bexley 18 and over and I'm going to go through now the various services that we offer um, so let me begin so firstly we have the IAPT service which is the talking therapy service and this is for people 18 and over who are registered with a Bexley GP who are experiencing mild to moderate anxiety or depression. So what that means is mild to moderate, basically somebody who is feeling anxious a lot of the time or feeling low a lot of the time. Um, 
and I would probably say mild to moderate it's a lot of us especially right now I think a lot of us are feeling quite low a lot of us are feeling quite anxious and there's things that we can do to help you move forward and um, sometimes all that we need is some coping strategies to learn how to identify these unhelpful thoughts or learn how to think differently or learn how to manage anxiety and this is what we do so we have um, some different talking therapies so we have counseling we have cognitive behavioral therapy which looks at your thought pattern and how your thoughts impact your behavior and we also offer online therapy as well so this is a cbt online program that you can work through at your own pace um, and you can either have um, assisted where you do it alongside a therapist and you meet with a therapist I think every two weeks and um, to go over your progress or you do it independently so we do have options so we don't just support people who are just experiencing anxiety and depression we also support people who have got long-term health conditions and um, so that might be diabetes irritable bowel syndrome etc we also get support therapy for parents in the perinatal period and parents of babies under one year we also support people who've gone through trauma and um, we've also, also provide bereavement support, especially if you've lost someone due to COVID. And the way you can kind of sign into this service or register for this service, sorry, is you can self-refer on our website or by giving us a call. The number is on our website as well. Um, or you can go to your GP and your GP will make a referral. Um, I get asked a lot of the time, you know, what's quicker in terms of the referral? It's exactly the same process. So you don't have to go to your GP because you think that that might have more standing or anything like that. You, you can make a self-referral this evening if you would like to. Um, the process is we receive your referral. We will then contact you to arrange an assessment with you with one of our therapists. And then within that half an hour, you will talk to a therapist about what's going on for you, where you're at, and we will be able to identify how best we can support you. And then we'll go from there. So next, we've got our recovery cottage service, and this is a service for um, anybody in Bexley with any mental health problem, or maybe you just want to learn more about mental health and well-being, and there's services for you as well. So it, within the recovery cottage umbrella, we offer telephone support for clients, we have a welfare rights team, so we'll help people access the correct benefits that they need, and um, we have an employment support team, and um, there's a carer service, and we also have an online digital timetable with an array of courses um, to help people improve their well-being. Um, so you can come on there and you basically, just like you've done today, really, you signed up to something and you received a link. It's exactly the same process. And I just want to go over this now because I think this is quite important for people to know about because it's easily accessed and it's something that you can do this evening. You can sign up this evening. So as you can see, we've got a variety of workshops there to aid wellbeing, but also to help people who are feeling quite isolated at the moment. So we've got a women's group, men's group, a creative writing group, um, yoga, preparing to return to work, um, a job club. You know, there's lots of different things there that individuals can access. And as, as I said, all you would need to do is go on the Mind and Bexley website. Um, you'd go to the Recovery College page and then there you will find this timetable and you will be, be able to select what ones you would like to join and when. And secondly, we've also got another section of that as well. So there is more on offer to you. These are all completely free. You can sign up whenever you like. Um, they're just for people 18 and over within Bexley and, and, and we cover East Kent too. So that's there. Obviously, if anyone's got any questions, you can ask and, and um, our moderators will be answering in the chat um, or I, I might ask, answer them later. So we've got lots there for individuals that like suicide awareness, understanding self-harm, coping with stress, coping with depression, because what we want to do, we want to give you the skills that you need um, to effectively um, aid your recovery, but as well as that, to give individuals in the borough the education around mental health. Um, so yeah, any questions on that, please put it in the chat. We've also got care of service, like I said earlier. So um, we don't only support people who've got a mental health problem. We look after their family, their friends, neighbours, whoever's looking after people. If you are looking after somebody who is 18 plus, they're living in Bexley and they're struggling with their mental health and or addiction, then we will support you. And what we will do, we will offer wellbeing calls. There'll be practical and emotional support for you. There's carers groups you can go to. There's relaxation sessions. Lots of things for you, because we know how hard it is to, to look after somebody, to be in that care and role. It can be exhausting. 
So we want to make sure that you are looked after as well. Um, there's a number there that you can call, but as I said, all the information is on the website. Apologies, I'm looking down, just making sure I've got enough time left because I can tend to rabbit on. Next, we've got a wellbeing line. So this originally began on the 1st of April last year. And, and the reason that was is because COVID came and we wanted to make sure that people could get to us. We wanted to make sure we could support as many possible, as many possible, as many people as possible in Bexley. So this line is for anybody in Bexley feeling stressed, worried, low, perhaps you just need to talk to someone, whatever your situation is, we are there on the other end of the line for you. Um, the telephone number's there, it's a free line, and we are open Monday to Friday, 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. So that's the time the line's open. Um, what we'll do, we'll listen, we'll offer support, um, we'll offer guidance, and we will refer you into our services, or you, we will signpost you into other services. So we do get a lot of people ringing that potentially aren't appropriate for our service, but they might be for another. So we will then signpost them to other services and guide them that way. We also have a crisis cast, so we have a drop-in service as well. And I'm really proud of this service. I'm proud of all the services, but I think this is the one that I'm, I kind of get excited. I guess excited is not the right word, but I'm proud of this service. So we have a drop-in service at our Mind and Bixie office that is open every single evening from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. Monday to Sunday. Throughout the whole of COVID, throughout all of the lockdowns, our incredible team have been there working to support people who are in crisis or who need to talk to someone immediately because of their mental health. So if you know anyone or if you need to talk to somebody and uh, you want to speak to someone face to face, come and see us. Um, it's at our Mind and Bexley office on Devonshire Road. And as I said, it's a drop in service. So um, you, you go to the door, they will let you in. You sign in um, because of COVID, obviously, you take your temperature and then you will speak to somebody, one of our mental health workers, for however long you need to, about what's going on for you. Similarly to the wellbeing line, they will support you, they will offer guidance and they will refer you into our services or signpost you to other services. Um, I know it's just a CAF, it's not a CAF, it's quite a confusing um, name. Um, it is just our um, Mind and Bexley, Bexley office and it is one to one support. Okay, we've also got Community Connect. So I had, did have a slide on this um, because we have uh, um, individuals in Mind of XC that work within this service, but I know it's going to be spoken about later. So I'm going to leave that to the lovely Alex. We also have a community pantry as well. Um, and, and this was started on the 1st of December last year. And the reason was is because we wanted to make sure that we was helping the community. There are lots of people in the borough that, that still go without, that still left hungry. Um, and, and we didn't feel really comfortable with that. We also know that there's a lot of people in the borough that won't go to food banks because they feel ashamed, they feel embarrassed, they don't want to accept charity. So we begun a community food store, basically. So people um, join us, so they'll start a membership with us, they pay four pound and they will get um, a variety of fresh frozen and tinned foods worth up to the value of 20 pound. Not frozen, fresh and tinned, apologies. Um, so you pay four pounds and then you get your food worth up to £20. Um, it's going really, really well, as you can imagine. And um, we're supporting a lot of families, a lot of people in the borough, um, and, and we're, we're here to support you. So it's open Tuesday and Wednesday, 11 to 2.30. All you need to do is book an appointment before you go. So you'd book a slot and then you would come in and then you've got access to the food and then just bring bags. That's all we ask. Please bring your bags, that's all. Um, so that's our service as well, and that is our revival CAF, which is next door to our Mind and Bexley office. So lastly, what I just want to end on um, is mental health support in Bexley. So there is some um, an urgent advice line as well, which is a 24 hours hour service. Um, so that's the number there. It's a free number. So if you're worried about um, anybody in the borough, you know, if you're concerned about yourself, um, you know, if you're worried about harming yourself, etc, whatever's going on, um, and you need immediate support, you can call that number, and they can support you. Um, alternatively, if you want to be listened to, Samaritans have got a 24 hour emotional support line, um, which is 116123, they will listen, they will take time, and you've got that space to talk. So like I was saying earlier, if you can't speak to people around you, there are services out there. Um, and if all else fails and you forget everything today, um, because my voice has been so boring, <laughs> you could always go to your GP and your GP will refer you into the service that you need. Um, but what I would say as well, you know, have a look on our website and we've also got a few self-help materials on there. So do have a good look through 
Um, and yeah, thank you very much for listening to me. And I hope this talk has been helpful. Um, but yeah, look forward to answering your questions later. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Laura. Thank you for all of those tips and coping strategies that are going to be really helpful for us to put into action in our day-to-day -day lives and for all that information about the resources and activities available. Um, everybody, thank you also for your questions. Please keep them coming so that I can put them to our panellists at the end of the evening. Our next speaker is Alex Fordham, who is a volunteer coordinator for Community Connect. everyone, uh, my name's Alex, I'm the Community Connect um, volunteer, co volunteer coordinator. Um, can everybody see my screen okay? Yes, I can yes. see your slides, just not on a slideshow as yet. Okay, perfect, yeah. Thank you, okay. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be talking to you today about Community Connect, um, which Laura touched on earlier. We are the social prescribing service in Bexley, um, and we help you to access um, support when, when you need it. Um, so we recognise, um, just like how Laura was saying, that you know lockdown has presented um, a new series of challenges, and they've taken a real toll on our health. Um, so we're facing, you know, many problems which we were facing previously but these may have um, increased in number or they may have increased in the severity so we appreciate that people may have financial worries they're just feeling overwhelmed by housing um, or finance issues for example it may be managing your weight stress and anxiety um, struggling with your mental health just generally feeling isolated and lonely um, and we can help support you with with many of these things so if you have an existing mental health issue, some of those issues that I just talked about, um, they can add to what you're already feeling. And if you don't have one, then, you know, they can still take a toll on how you're feeling. Um, so Community Connect is here to support you with, with many of those things. Um, as long as you are registered to a Bexley GP and are over the age of 18. So we are a free local service um, and what we do is we help to connect you with many different charities and groups, organisations um, that can help you feel more connected to the wider community and, and help tackle some of the things that, are, that you're struggling with at the moment. So at the bottom of my screen here, um, you can see some of the things that we might be able to help you with. So that's, for example, um, debt and money advice, stress, stress and anxiety. Um, substance or alcohol dependency, being a carer, um, bereavement, managing health conditions. Um, they're just some of the things that we could help support. So, sorry, <laughs> I lost my voice there. And um, what happens is um, we'll receive your referral and then with seven day, within seven days, we'll get back to you and we'll arrange a time to talk to you um, and we'll talk through um, kind of the wider things around some of the some of the feelings that you're having and try to find a group or an organisation that might be able to provide some support for you. And we can then make referrals to those organisations on your behalf. So hopefully that kind of takes some of the stress out of it for you. Um, after that, we'll check in with you a few weeks later, see how you're doing and see if the support that we've offered is right for you. And you can always call us in the meantime if you'd like more support or want to find out any further information. So now I'm just going to talk a little bit about what support we might be able to refer you to. So these are just some examples of some community activities. So it could be a gardening group, could be an art group. Um, Laura spoke earlier on about kind of doing something that, that makes you feel good and is mindful as well. So when you're focusing on one thing at, at a time, it, it really helps maybe kind of take some of those negative thoughts away and lets you focus on something and helps you feel part of something bigger as well. Um, we also have talking therapies here, walking groups, 
Um, and we all know the the benefit of of getting out and having some good exercise. And you know, when you can do that with other people as well, it can really help boost our mood. We can help connect you to volunteering opportunities, um, education and courses, um, yeah, lots of different things. And these are some of the core providers that we could do a referral to for you. So you may see some uh, organisations here that you already know, um, but there may be some that you're you're not so familiar with. Um, so we have Bexley Women's Aid, for example, um, Carers Support, who provide advice for, for carers in Bexley, um, Evergreen Care, that offer befriending, as well as home support, and, you know, they can connect you with trusted traders, things like that. Bexley Deaf Centre, they have a hearing aid clinic, um, as well as offering a job club and social groups for, for deaf people in Bexley. Um, we have mine in Bexley, obviously, we've had Laura speaking to you today. The Volunteer Centre, we can connect you to, to volunteers, um, to volunteering, sorry. And we also are offering um, a service at Community Connect, where we can connect you to um, volunteers um, who can support you with, with languages. So we have specific language-based volunteers who are able to talk to you in, in your own, oh, sorry, <laughs> in your uh, native language, as well as supporting you maybe to even improve your English if you, if you, if you wish to do that. So that's, that's something that we're offering at the moment and it's been really, really beneficial for a lot of people. So do get in touch if that's something that you would like and we can see if we can help you. So as you just saw my next slide, I'm just going to give two uh, examples of, um, of where we've been able to help people. So Erprit was struggling to come to terms with her illness and the way it was affecting her life. Um, so she was facing a diagnosis, diagnosis of fibromyalgia, as well as anxiety and depression. And this just meant that she was struggling to cope um, and even her young children were starting to notice a change in her. So she went to her GP and they were able to connect her to us um, and they referred her to us. And what we then did was we met with her, discussed kind of what was going on, how we might be able to help. And then alongside her, we decided to together to do some referrals. So we referred her to Mind in Bexley and she started going to therapy, um, well, it's actually group therapy. And this then started to re rebuild her confidence. She also was referred to Healthy Walks and this helped her to meet new people. Um, and we also connected her to some local fibromyalgia support groups. So after three weeks and then again at three to six months, we checked in with her um, and fortunately she was doing so much better. She was really happy with the services that we had connected her to um, and really felt like the therapy in particular was something that allowed her to boost her mood and, and make new friends and, you know, helped her kind of move on and start to see more positive changes in her life. This is also an example of Thomas. So he wasn't sure where to turn to get help for his two sons. Um, he realised that he needed support caring for them, as well as applying for benefits and just general form filling. Um, so when he went to the GP, again, they referred him to us and we then referred him to Irish Community Services and they helped him with the form filling. Um, and we also connected him with Evergreen and, and they supported him with caring support as well as cleaning services. Again, we carried out our three week and our three month check in with Thomas and he was happy with the support that we gave him um, and was really pleased with the services. And he wasn't really sure where to turn to before Community Connect, but we were able to kind of help turn that corner for him. Um, and it's also important to say here that even though both of these examples, they were happy with the support, if they weren't or if they felt like they needed something extra or maybe it wasn't quite right, you know, we would then maybe reassess and see if there was something else that we could do to support. So here is just um, a sample of some of the things that we've been able to do to support people. So um, we've been able to get people blue badges um, we've had carers starting to go into people's homes and to give them the support that they need. Um, people have had occupational therapist assessments, um, they've had befrienders, they've either started volunteering or they may now receive a, a volunteer befriender or someone who kind of comes around and helps them out with things. Um, whether that's over the phone, obviously during COVID, most of that's been telephone befriending. Uh, people have started to 
uh, go to adult education classes and that's then then led to get gaining qualifications and going back to work so you know it's really really varied the support that we are able to give people so here you can find out uh, how to contact us so at the top there you've got our website so you don't have to go to your GP you can do it online but um, by going through your GP you know then we'll get more information and it will, it will kind of follow up through there but you can self-refer and um, you can also contact us here with our um, email address if you want to know more information after today or give us a call if there's anything you know that you've been interested in then please do get in touch and you can also follow us on social media you have our uh, Twitter and our Instagram at the bottom. Thank you everyone for listening and please do put any questions in the chat, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you so much Alex for your presentation and it's really helpful to know that there's so much help out there with the kind of social um, difficulties that can lead to problems with um, mental health, so thank you for that. Okay, I'm just about to open the floor for questions, so please keep the <laughs> questions coming in the question and answer box, that will remain open. Um, we'll also be posting a short questionnaire in the question and answer box, um, just in case you'd like to um, give us any feedback or your thoughts on the event. The questionnaire will also be emailed out to you likely tomorrow in case you prefer to have more time to think about it. Okay, so let's open the floor up for questions. So panellists, if you could put your uh, videos on for me, please, and mics. Sorry for the delay. Not at all. Okay, thanks everybody. Okay, so um, had a common theme really about um, long COVID. A few people have unfortunately suffered with that or had difficulties with relatives who've suffered with long COVID. And they're asking whether there's any specific uh, provision for psychological therapies relating to long COVID or um, any medical provision for people who are suffering from long COVID. So if we go to Laura first for the psychological provision and then to Dr. Shah. So we do recognise that obviously this, this is going to be an issue moving forward. And, and if this is you right now and you are suffering from long COVID, please do make a referral into us and we will see how best we can support you. We know a lot of people are feeling really low, just a bit stuck still um, and, and sometimes quite hopeless. So do make a referral into us and, and we can see how best we can support you. Thanks, and I'd, I'd second that. I'd say, you know, make the referral into mind, but also make sure that you're speaking to your GP. And what we've seen particularly today in the questions and answers, a lot of questions about long COVID, but a lot of variation in the types of symptoms that people are getting. So we can't necessarily give you a, a one size fits all answer as to what you can do to help you. But that's why it's really important to ask those questions and seek that help. There are specialist long COVID clinics available that may be suitable for you. But as I said, because the range of symptoms is so wide, we can't say for definite what will work for you. But that's why you need to explain what your symptoms are to your GP and then we can come up with a plan and it could involve several different things it could involve mind it could involve your GP it could involve specialist clinics or other things but we should be able to come up with a, a program of things that can help you. Thank you both. Um, another question along the Covid theme um, a couple of people have asked a question with anxiety not related to COVID as such, but more related to things opening up and them having to use public transport, going back to work, socialising and mixing with people. Um, they just want to know whether we're seeing a lot of this or whether this is a typical reaction and if they've got any specific um, tips to help them, Laura. Yeah, no problem. And, and thank you to people who've asked that question, because I do think that a lot of us are feeling that right now and you really aren't alone. Uh, I think all of the panellists have felt that as well, you know, very overwhelmed about, you know, suddenly going back to work and, and things changing and getting on public transport. And you really are not alone in this. So please don't think you are. And, you know, you've done something wrong or there's something strange about you. We are all going through this in very different ways. So I just want to say that, you know, what you're experiencing is, 
is is normal you know completely normal we've gone through something we never expected to go through and now we're just expected to kind of get back to it and that can be quite difficult so the things that I would say is is firstly open up about how you're feeling you know be very honest about how you're feeling and talk to people around you whether that's family friends people at work call us call the helpline you know please don't just sit with these feelings on your own because you really aren't alone and it can be really helpful for you when you do talk um another thing that I would say is give yourself time um a lot of us we want to kind of run before we jump Run before we jump. Okay, basically, what I'm trying to say is that we we want to be exactly how we was before. So, for instance, um, a good example is I haven't done a presentation face to face in over a year. I know that I'm going to find that quite difficult, but I'm going to give myself time, and I'm, I'm I know that already. So I know that when I do that first talk, I know I'm going to be feeling quite uncomfortable, but that's okay because I haven't done it in such a long time. So give yourself that time and just own it and know that yes, this is hard right now, but it's not always going to stay this hard. And if there is something particularly scary that you are about to do or that you're particularly anxious about, what are the things you can put in place to make things easier for you? So for instance, if it was getting on public transport, for instance, is there anything you can do beforehand to make your journey a bit more comfortable or to get your mindset in the right place? So maybe you put on like really good music before you get on the train or the tube or you kind of psych yourself up for it basically um so sometimes it's about all in the planning um but yeah my main thing is give yourself time and reach out when you need it and, and please don't be ashamed to because we're all in the same boat that's great thank you laura um another a participant just wants to know if you've got any recommendations for any podcasts and I suppose this extends to any sort of other online tools or websites that sort of thing. Thank you so um, I actually don't listen to podcasts however this question has come up quite a bit if you go on the National Mind website they have got a list of lots of different podcasts that you could look at um, and alternatively um, I asked my colleagues about this and they said TED Talks are really good for anxiety um, but yeah, I would really welcome anyone else's suggestions because I'm probably not that useful in this question. Apologies. <laughs> I don't listen to that many, um, but I think that Happy Place by Fern Cotton is really good. I don't know if anybody else here listens to that, but um, it's it's all about mindfulness and well-being, and um, she interviews different people each week. So you might kind of find somebody that you know, like a famous person. So, and it's just really good about how people in everyday life kind of manage their health and well-being and their mental health um so yes i definitely recommend that and ted talks they are really good that's great thank you both um shalaya who's our pharmacist that's helping moderate questions has also suggested brain care and said that that's a good podcast for support with mental health we will be emailing out a list of kind of resources and support organizations related to mental health and on that list there are a few podcasts and apps actually, which you may find helpful. So the next question, uh, probably for you, Dr. Shah, is about antidepressants. And um, the participant has said, what should I do if I'm on antidepressants? And I exercise, I don't drink, but I still have terrible spells of anxiety and depression. So it's about how do you know when your antidepressant is working for you or at what time might be the right time to think, oh, it's not working and perhaps I should change dosage or should switch antidepressant? Okay, I think that's a really good question. Um, and I think the one thing that I say with medication is everybody's different. So, you know, we'd love to say, look, we're gonna give you this pill and it's gonna fix everything, but sadly it doesn't work like that. And we can all react differently to different medications. We may need either different tablets or different doses but also we may need things as well as medication. So medication definitely has a role to play, but for some people medication on its own won't be enough. So it may be that you need say counseling through mind or CBT through mind, something like that, as well as the medication. So there may be other things to look at there, but I'd say if there's concern about the medication itself and you're thinking that I'm on this medication and I don't think it's working because it's not doing what I want it to do, then I think that's definitely a conversation to have with your GP because there are always options. So depending on the dose that you're on, it may be that your dose needs adjusting. It may be that that tablet isn't working for you and you need a different tablet. But I would say that's definitely a conversation to have with your GP because in an ideal world, what we want is 
if you're on the medication, we want it to work and we want you to feel well and feel that you're, you know, your usual self and that you're enjoying life. And if you're still struggling in spite of being on the medication, then I think it's really important to speak to your GP about that. Thank you for that. Thank you. I think, Alex, you've inspired a few people. We've had a few questions, uh, people asking how they can become volunteers, because we know that that actually that can have a, a positive impact on mental health. Yeah, definitely. So, um, like I said, if, if you do end up doing a referral through Community Connect, then we can kind of talk to you about the different volunteering options out there. Um, also, the Volunteer Centre in Bexley is is a fantastic resource. If you so if you Google that Volunteer Centre Bexley, um, you know you can search everything that's out there. Um, and volunteering does have huge impact on our on our well being because you get to do something good for somebody else, which in turn makes you feel good. And it also might inspire you to kind of do something that you've maybe not done for a while, kind of get back in and, and teach somebody else something new, uh, share your love or your passion, whether that's kind of cooking or drawing or just talking to people and trying to make other people feel good, that can also make you feel good. Thank you, Alex. And um, we've had a couple of questions relating to weight and the weight gain that can come sometimes come with the increased um, appetite with um, depression and affect self-image, so contributing to um, depression in that way. Um, are there any, is there any help that people can access via mind, any support groups or anything, Laura? Or is there any help, um, Dr. Shah, that people can access via their GP that you're aware of? So Laura, do you want to go first? So in terms of medication and weight gain? Um, in terms of, are there any sort of psychological support groups for people who are struggling with their weight through mind or not, not currently? Not currently, but it is a good suggestion. So I'll keep that one and I'll feed that back. <laughs> Thank you. I'll also just come in, Emma, just before Dr. Shah speaks, just to say that we also do receive referrals at Community Connect regarding weight management, um, not necessarily completely just linked with depression, but just in general, we appreciate that, you know, people's weights do, people's weight does fluctuate. Um, and we try to look at maybe the reason for that. Is it is it medication that might be something different? But you know, if we were to get people exercising a little bit more, or maybe some healthier eating tips, as well as cooking um, and starting to enjoy your food, um, so that's definitely something that we can support people with. Yeah, and there are um, things that your GP can refer you to because you're right; it can be really complex for some people. The relationship between mental health and diet and weight. Um, but there are things that you can be referred to, um, especially as now things are opening up again and hopefully our gyms and leisure centers are gonna open up. So exercise, um, you know, things for weight loss. And, you know, I said, everybody's different. So you'll always be treated as an individual. So it may be about talking through what's available and of those options, which one is going to work for you and which one do you think would suit you best? But yes, there are resources available that can help you. That's great, thank you. Um, really good question, actually. How do I know if I'm suffering from anxiety or depression? When does it cross that line from feeling you know, low or a situational problem to actually something that um, I might, might need to seek help with? Um, Dr. Shaw? That is a really good question. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, you know, Laura, I'm, I'm going to come to you in a second and see what you think, because I, I think, again, like Laura said, that's a really good question, because how do you know? All of us will feel down at times. How do we know when that is now depression? And I think what I always say is actually it's about the impact on you. You know, there are uh, lots of things that you can do. There are things that you can look at online. There'll be, you know, scoring tools and questionnaires and things that will say, look, have you got depression if you score more than a certain amount? Yes. Yeah, so that's certainly something that you can do if you want to look at it and get a feel for whether you might have it. But actually, it's really individual. And a big part of it is the impact that it's having on you. So what impact is it having on you personally and how you feel? But then also, how is it impacting on you at home, in your relationships, at work. So it's really about putting everything together and then making that decision. But one of the other things that I often say to people is also don't get too hung up on a label. 
don't get too focused on have I got depression or not? Have I got anxiety or not? Don't worry too much about a label. Just look at where you are, how you're feeling and what help or support you might need. And I think that's the important thing. Laura, what do you think? I would really echo what you just said about looking at how you can support yourself, because sometimes we do get bogged down by a label and and how we should we should feel. And actually, we all feel very differently. So, for instance, anxiety will be different for all of us. You know, I might get chest pains when I have anxiety, whereas Emma might shake. You know, we, we could be entirely different. Um, and what I would say about knowing um, whether you have got anxiety or depression or you do need support is definitely about the impact it's having on you and how it's affecting your everyday life that's really important because if you're doing a stressful event you know if you're talking like this and you find that quite comfortable you're going to be anxious if you're doing something you've not done before you might feel anxious however if you are experiencing anxiety every day in your everyday life and it's um, trivial matters it might be that you are struggling with anxiety but if you're unsure call us you know we can have a chat you know call our well-being line and just talk things through sometimes there's a lot of power in just just speaking and and saying how you feel yeah thank you both that's really helpful um the questionnaire link has been put in the q a so please if you have a moment um after the webinar please do complete that if you're able to um i've got a question about friends and family and how to talk to friends and family about uh, mental health difficulties that you might be having, how to help them to understand that you might need time and space to relax. And second part of that question is whether there are any support groups for uh, family, friends, loved ones of people who have mental health difficulties that you're aware of. Laura. So firstly, um, our, our carer service is available for your family and friends. So we have a service, as I said, that looks after family, friends, neighbours of individuals who are struggling with their mental health. And we do have carer groups that they can attend. And, and it's really comforting in numbers, isn't it, sometimes when you are with people that are going through something similar to you. And, and I guess what we've got to remember as well, your family and friends, they might not understand what's going on for you, but it, it can be very frustrating for you because you just want them to understand and they might just need a bit more education. So maybe they come through to the recovery college and do a few workshops on depression or anxiety or whatever you're experiencing. Um, there is a great resource on National Mind as well. And it says like how to support someone who's going through a mental health problem. So maybe show them that webpage and let them read it, you know, help them to help you. Um, and, and sometimes it's just all in the education. And, and what I would say as well, it's telling them what you need. And, you know, when I'm feeling low, I need to either be by myself or I need you to sit with me or I need us to look at an article together. You know, what is it you need? Help them to help you. Thank you, Laura. Um, we've had a question um, asking, should I consider going to my GP with regards and support for alcohol? Um, and I think probably if you're thinking along those lines, and it sounds as though it may be um, something that you could seek help for. Um, is that something that BVSC might be able to help with signposting for, Alex? Yeah, certainly we could signpost for, for that. Um, I'd also... I guess it would depend on on how that conversation went and um, and you know maybe we would also suggest that you also let your gp know because they may be able to offer um further support but it depends how you how you feel personally if you wanted to go down that route um but, but no we certainly could support you with that information and you know we, we treat the information confidentially as well thank you alex Laura, we've had a, some questions about the waiting lists for MIND. It's quite a general question. I wonder if you could talk about, you know, a few of the services that you offer, um, the talking therapies, as well as the activities you've mentioned, and just give us an idea of what the waiting um, times are at the moment, please. Yeah, no problem at all. So um, I guess the main one that probably everyone wants to know about is, is the IAP talking therapy service. Um, and I'm, I'm really sorry, I'm unable to give you kind of a definite answer on our waiting times because it is really dependent on what you're going through, who you are, what appointments you want. Um, it, it, it is on a case by case basis sometimes. Um, so in terms of when you make a referral, um, we aim to get back to you within the week. So we want you to have your assessment within that week. 
Um, and then from there, you will be on a waiting list. And usually you'll be put into groups, um, which is quite quickly. That can be within, within the next few weeks. However, if you are waiting for one-to-one -one support, um, you will be waiting considerably longer. Um, and unfortunately, that is because lots of us are struggling with our mental health. However, there are lots of services where you can come through to us immediately. That is the recovery college. We can learn lots of coping strategies to help you cope with anxiety or depression while you wait for therapy. We've also got the wellbeing line that you can call any day. We've also got the crisis cath service that's open every evening. There are lots of um, services for you while you are awaiting therapy. And don't forget when you are awaiting therapy as well, there is the option for you to go on the CBT online therapy tool called Silver Cloud. Um, so don't think that you will be left. There are options for you to utilize different services while you do wait for therapy. Thank you so much, Laura. Um, Alex, we've had a question we got from someone who's felt very isolated during lockdown, who's working from home and who's, you know, due to social isolate, um, isolating, spending a lot of time at home. Um, what kind of activities and things have you been able to signpost people to during lockdown while social distancing is in effect? Thanks. That's a really good question because there's um, so many different things out there. And like you said, during lockdown, it has been has been really tough to have the, those same connections with people and um, it's been really varied what we can connect you to and I think what's important is that we would meet you first of all and um, obviously it would be virtual but we would would meet and we would discuss your um discuss what interests you what do you like doing what's going to really make a difference for you and um, because what would work for me might not work for you so that's really key but just um an example is that um there's a there's a service at the moment called Launchpad and they are running sessions at the moment to really kind of get people back together and get used to kind of doing those socializing kind of things again it is it is over zoom um but I think it's a really nice way for people to start having those conversations again and and feeling more supported other things that we've been referring people to is um kind of just doing online yoga classes, for example, going out for walks, um, connecting people to, to volunteering opportunities as well across the borough, supporting people who, who need help during COVID. Um, that could also be telephone befriending. People have really, really enjoyed um, carrying out telephone befriending because it allows you to connect with somebody else who might live in a different area. Um, and also, like I said before, we've been having uh, the specific language focus roles um, and that's kind of really opened up people's opportunities to volunteer and have a different connection as well maybe kind of share stories from your own cultures that you've maybe kind of missed thank you Alex we've had some great feedback actually about the crisis cafe and about it being a safe space and people feeling as though they've been able to talk about their problems in an unhurried unhurried way and actually also enjoy a cup of tea so um, just to feed that back to you Laura oh thank you I'll feed that back to the team they do a great job thank you um the other thing feedback that we've had about some of the mind services is there's such a wealth of activities particularly via the recovery college that you know it's been a real learning point for me actually and something that I'll encourage patients to engage with um someone had mentioned that they're a living carer so they're only available to um to attend at weekends and other people work nine to five and they've asked whether there are any services available in the evening so I guess firstly activities such as recovery college and such like but also people um, have been allocated to talking therapy groups or one-to-one -one therapy or any of those available evenings or weekends? Yeah so we actually are for instance the talking therapy is open till 8 p.m I think Monday to Thursday and we are open on Saturdays so we do recognize that you know obviously there's lots of people that are working full-time and we, and we will make allowances of that. Um, in terms of recovery college of course you know we will put on courses and workshops depending on demand so we recently just put up a course about preparing after lockdown because we understand that that's something really key on people's minds at the moment. So we have got a course that's on from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. But, you know, it'd be really good to know whether that's the right timings. But yes, of course, you know, we will always aim to grow and, and catch different people, definitely. Thank you, Laura. Um, Dr. Shaw, I think this might be a question um, that you might be able to answer for us. 
someone's a bit concerned about um, having angry outbursts and they're wondering if this is a typical symptom of anxiety or even OCD, so irritability. Yeah, I mean, you can get outbursts. As you say, you can become frustrated, irritable. You may find, you know, I said earlier at the beginning, things that wouldn't normally annoy you would annoy you. And it can be that you feel that you're at the end of your tether all the time and that if anything happens, it, it's just the last straw. So certainly angry outbursts could be a part of it. Um, but obviously without knowing the rest of the background, we can't say for definite, but they can be. So anger and frustration and ir irritability certainly can be a part of depression or anxiety, or if there's an element of OCD in there as well, certainly that could be part of it. Um, but of course, we, we can't say that it's definitely caused by that. I think it would need somebody to have, to have a look at the big picture and get an overall view of how things are to be able to say whether it was that that's causing the outburst. That's great, thank you. I had a question asking um, about support services for young people who are struggling with their mental health. And so even though this webinar is aimed at adults, um, when we send out the information tomorrow about support organisations and resources, there will be a list for some support organisations for children and young people. So just to make you aware. Laura, we've had a question asking about IAP services and what kind of translation services are available? What, what kind of languages do you have available? So we do have a variety of languages and we also do have interpreters as well via the telephone. So we, we can um, make sure that we are um, supporting lots of different people in different languages. That's not a problem. Thank you. And are you offering any services for anger management at the moment? People are specifically asking about that. Not at the moment, unfortunately. But as I said, you know, with demand and everything, if there's a need, I'm sure we'll put it on. Um, but no, currently not. Um, I'm trying to think what services do. No, yeah, unfortunately, I can't give any more information on that. Apologies. Thanks, Laura. Um, Alex, we've had a question about um, how can um, someone ask their GP to refer them into Community Connect. I think you touched on this um, in your presentation, but can you just remind us how we can self-refer to Community Connect? Yeah, of course. So um, you can ask your GP. So if you go to your GP and, and let them know about what's kind of happening with you, then, then you might ask them, do you think I'm right for Community Connect? But I would suggest that if you're already considering that, then you probably are, um, but you can self-refer. So um, this is being recorded and, and therefore you will have the slides. So you'll have our uh, website and all of our links and things at the end there. But if you just Google um, Community Connect Bexley, the self-referral page will be there um, and you just put your details in and we would get in touch with you within seven days. Perfect. Thank you, Alex. Laura, someone has um, mentioned that they've had a course of CBT a few years ago, and they're wondering if they would be able to access a refresher. Um, do you do specific refresher courses or how does that we work? We don't do specific refresher courses, but of course you can self-refer again into the IAP service so you can access CBT. Um, it might be if you're just looking for a particular refresher, the online therapy program might be useful for you. So you've got all the CBT information that you can go through at your pace. Um, but it is, it is dependent. You have that discussion with your therapist on the phone. Um, and I'd also recommend the Recovery College as well, because there's a lot of coping strategies that you'll pick up from there too. But yes, of course, you can self-refer in. Perfect, thank you. Okay, please keep the questions coming in. Um, I think it's just a good time to remind people of some of the crisis support that's available. Um, there is a, a message in the Q&A section about the Oxley's crisis line. That's a 24-hour crisis line that you can speak to a mental health professional if you're going through a mental health crisis. Laurel's also mentioned the crisis cafe opens 6 till 10 every single evening, even bank holidays, and they've been open throughout lockdown, as, as Laura has said. Um, you can call the Samaritans on 116123. Um, but I think if you really are feeling as if you can't keep yourself safe or other people safe, then um, 
the best thing is to also to attend your local A and E, and that would be um, probably for us Darrant Valley um, or Queen Elizabeth somewhere with an actual A and E department, rather than Erith or Queen Mary's Hospital. Okay. So we have a question from someone who's asking about support specifically for males. Um, talking about sort of the societal stigma sometimes with um, men who talk about their mental health and whether you do any support groups or specific therapies um, for men, Laura? So we don't have any specific therapies for men, but we do currently have a men's group within the recovery college that, that is basically a, a peer support group. They get together and previously they were kind of walking around Danson Park together. And then obviously with COVID, they were doing things online. Um, but for them, it was really nice to have people to talk to where they felt like they could connect um, but I do agree that there's more that can be done with men's mental health and, and is on one of our agendas so um, yeah I would say that if you are struggling with your mental health and you're male please come into our service anyway but yes I agree you know um, men's mental health is something that um, is very very important. Okay, thank you Laura thank you. Um, we've had a question, probably this is one for you, Dr. Shah, uh, from a patient who had some side effects when they first started on their antidepressant, which have settled. And they're a bit concerned because they're upping their dose. They're wondering whether they might um, suffer similar side effects as their dose is increased. Well, it can be quite common when you first start the antidepressants to get a few side effects. And as they found, that usually settles pretty quickly within a few days as your body gets used to the new medication. Now, I wish I could give you a nice, easy and clear answer to this, but usually what happens when you start on an antidepressant, you start on a low dose, and then for most people, that dose may need to be increased. Now, if you had side effects when you first started that medication, will you definitely get those again when you increase the dose? The honest answer is that there's no way that we can say for definite. I would say that in my experience, most patients don't get the side effects when they increase the dose. And that's because their body is used to the medication, it's in their system. So as they up the dose, they don't tend to get the side effects. Or if they do, they're much more minor and they settle very quickly. But there is always that chance because everybody is different and because we all react to medication differently. There is unfortunately that small chance that you may get those side effects each time you increase the dose. But the good news is that if that does happen, it will be the same as when you first started the medication, that they will settle very quickly. Thank you, thank you. Um, Alex, we've had a question about bereavement and can you tell us a little bit about the services that you signpost to for bereavement? Yeah, so um, one of the services that we refer to is called CRUS um, and they offer specific um, bereavement uh, counselling. Um, and also just through speaking to us, um, you may have even had bereavement counselling before. Um, so it might be that that's not right for you this time. It could be something else um, that we might be able to support you with. And um, that could also just be regular and um, weekly welfare calls, for example, with one of our volunteers, just to give you a chance to, to speak about it um, with somebody else. Um, it could also be that we could try and connect you to other groups, um, support groups, for example, uh, things that are happening at mine, we could try to refer you to, to counselling. Um, so, yeah, lots of different things that we Thank you, Alex. Another question, um, someone asking about any specific tips or groups for people who have got significant physical illness who might be immobile um, and maybe who prior to the pandemic wouldn't have been able to get to um, sort of face-to-face -face therapies. And are there different groups that you signpost people to, Alex, at BVSC? Because I've seen the box. Um, for when I'm referring patients as to whether they're being referred for physical illness. So actually it's quite interesting to learn um, how you signpost people with physical illnesses. Um, yeah, so again, it is a it is an individual on an individual basis that we would do those referrals. Um, Thankfully, this year, obviously, so many more things have gone online. So there are so many more things open to people. Um, and we can also kind of 
signpost people to lots of different um even kind of mild exercise classes there might be some like chair yoga things like that um there's also groups run by lots of different um lots of the different uh, organizations that i showed you earlier on the screen and um, then we have mencap of course and they uh, are running lots of different groups for people um and alongside those kind of like actual physical activities we have um we could provide telephone um befriending or telephone welfare calls for example so kind of just allowing you to keep in touch and one of the great things through that is that even though it might only be once a week um you know it's something to look forward to something that uh, you can kind of share ideas of what to do during the week things that both of you find really useful to to keep your own mental health um well uh, so yeah some of our volunteers they kind of they share different books that they're reading and then they the following week they'll chat about those things or tv series that they're watching different walks that they go on so you know there's lots of things that we can we can suggest perfect alex thank you with just some feedback that we've had from someone who says, just to reassure people, I reached crisis point a few weeks ago and my GP referred me to the mental health team. I had a call from somebody within 24 hours. Um, they prescribed me some medication and also referred me to Mind Recovery College and Reinstate. Mind also contacted me really quickly and I'm signed up to some Mind workshops next week. They've also met with somebody from Rian State. So they say that every person has been incredibly supportive and they're really grateful. So they really want to encourage people to seek help if they need it and ask people not to suffer in silence, which I think is a great point to end on because that's really what we're trying, the point we're trying to get across is that there's so much, it's difficult sometimes to know how to access this report, but um, hopefully we've given you a, um, a little bit of guidance about that and we would encourage you to seek help if you need it and please not to suffer in silence so i'd just like to say a huge thank you to all of our speakers to dr samina shah to laura burke to alex fordham thank you to jatinda rai from community connect um, to sophie organ and david blows from nhs southeast london ccg Thank you to Drs. Hudson and Drs. Cayley for um, helping moderating the questions and also to Shalaya Asengwa for your help. A huge, huge thank you to you, our audience, for joining us. Thank you and also for all of your questions this evening. We really hope that you found the webinar helpful um, and we'd encourage you to make use of the resources that we've all learned about tonight. So it would really help us to improve the service that we offer you if you're able to spare a few minutes to fill out our questionnaire and leave some comments for us what went well what could be improved um, and thank you everybody thanks again thank you <laughs>